successful program and we have achieved a lot of results. I'm very happy to welcome all of you and our distinguished speaker to this program and I hope you enjoy it as much as you enjoy it. As you know that the Iranian audience come gradually <laughs> by the end of the time we have a full house. <laughs> so, but we will have a video and all of the Iman interface system of our unity is being uh, broadcasted on YouTube. If you want to see the years before, you are welcome to do so. Even we had one in the mall for our study the past day. Okay. When I call your name, please come and sit from here. Father Alexi. No, how did I know? <laughs> <laughs> Again? <laughs> father Alexi is Iman's father. Yeah. <laughs> and my priest. <laughs> and uh, our rabbi is Rabbi Benya. This is the way we set the people. One Christian, one Jewish, and one Muslim. Who's going to come next? Dr. Zaman Stanzai. Rabbi Kohl. Elder Greer. Now, the rest of the speakers, when they come, they go to the end of the line. That means they have, they eat late. so much. So glad it's been an honor to be here. My name is Rabbi Arye Cohen. I am a professor of rabbinic literature at the American Jewish University in the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. I train rabbis. I'm also the co-convener of the Black Jewish Justice Alliance. Um, I'm Zaman Stanisay. Um, I'm a professor. I teach nobody learns a thing. Maybe that's why I'm here. 
And today I have the privilege of being sandwiched between two rabbis that are all studying from my dad. <laughs> so I better behave myself. Uh, I don't have much affiliation. I consider myself, uh, in, in real sense, a, a, a world citizen. Um, I don't do not like the word citizen, except maybe in some Japanese watch, but uh, I don't know that. Uh, I think, uh, I, I feel um, there's too much uh, uh, artificiality uh, to those borders that separate nations, people, and then, as if that weren't enough, uh, then we draw more lines between people who believe in one or the other faith, and if there is only one God, why bother? And that, that's how I feel. So I consider myself a person, uh, kind of uh, a universalist, faithless, um, God worshiper. If that makes sense, that's good. If it doesn't, I will have to think about it a little bit more. Thank you. <laughs> He's told me something so he did not, he did not invite him as a comedian. <laughs> We invite him, no matter what he said, as a Muslim representative. Hello, uh, my name is Chaim Daliat. Uh, I'm a rabbi, and I've been here. Um, I thought this was the 40th time, but if you say 20, I'll count. You saw very too much. Yes. Um, uh, so, uh, I been active in a lot of politics, um, concerns about Middle East peace, been involved in a lot of California politics, concerned about the inappropriate way in which many nonprofits conduct themselves, and I've uh, also been active as a congregational rabbi um, and have spent uh, many years living uh, in Israel, and currently I work with a number of um, small congregations in a place called Poland. And uh, part of my work is that we run a series of webinar discussions on uh, current issues uh, related to the conflicting nationalisms that have already been mentioned, um, and uh, the struggles that um, exist. Um, and um, while I'm not quite where the gentleman to my right is, I'm very close. We may make up the first team of two um, in that uh, uh, I've found that in many ways um, the labels um, prevent people from fully appreciating uh, who the people are. Uh, though I think the labels are very important because they do allow us to um, track where people are coming from. I'll say more about that, I'm sure, in the conversation. Uh, I now turn it over to the uh, Los Angelino Polish priest to my left. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. I'm Father Lexi. I'm the priest here at the Ivan Center. And uh, I'm also the uh, I'm a pastor, a Greek Catholic pastor in, of two small congregations in El Segundo. And I, since the year 2000, I've been serving as the, what we term in the Catholic Church, the ecumenical and interreligious officer for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, which means that I direct the Catholic Church's relations with all of the religions here. I'm now entering into my 23rd year of doing this. I don't know whether that's because I'm any good at it or because nobody else wants to do it. But anyway, I'm here. Thank you. You mean people don't have any choice? Mm, no choice. Then. No, it's not because we don't have a choice. We are really appreciated here. Okay, uh, I want to start with some uh, issues that one of the religion that is being represented here has suffered some time in this country. Recently, there was some graffiti and vandalism at the Vermont Islamic Center. It was interesting, all of the news broadcasters said that Koreatown Islamic Center. <laughs> uh, I don't believe that any Korean gives me that Islamic Center. But the homeless guy 
puts out the insulting word to the wall of the Islamic Center. But the good thing was the reaction of the community and the media to this, which it was never done like this. So there's no question we are dealing with the Islamophobia. We are dealing with anti-Semitism. And uh, there is one more issue that they don't talk about it anymore because they passed this stage. I'm going to ask uh, Father Alexi to tell us what kind of the problem you have, the Catholic in this country. Well, we've had all kinds of problems. We don't have a lot to do, but um, uh, first of all, let me just make a comment or two about the Islamic Center's uh, um, horror that people would write, that someone would write what they wrote on the columns of the Islamic Center. It was there that day when we were the, the press conference of civic, civic officials and some interreligious types, like myself, showing solidarity with the Muslim community here. Um, we are all uh, of the Abrahamic faiths here. We believe in the same God, and therefore an uh, attack or a desecration of any one house of worship is an attack on all of our houses of worship. Therefore, we must stand absolutely together when it comes to, to denouncing this type of thing. The, um, uh, when I said that afternoon, uh, I said that I was there to show my, uh, the Archdiocese's commitment to stand with the Muslim community against any type of desecration of mosques, as the Muslim community stood with us when there was a similar incident actually here in Culver City some years ago. Um, I'm going to tell about that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of you know where St. Augustine Catholic Church is here over on Jasmine. But some years ago, a statue outside the church, the statue of Mary, was beheaded. And there was a a uh, handwritten sign there left saying um, there was only one God but Muhammad and Muhammad is his prophet. And it, this kind of created a lot of tension initially. And I remember uh, our Archbishop at that time, Cardinal Mahoney and myself, went to the Islamic Center and we met with uh, the late Mahar Tut and uh, Salam al Mariati and some of the other leaders of the Muslim community there. And uh, we, off we suggested this be calm here, and let's see what's going to develop. The Maha Ratut offered uh, to uh, rally Muslim men and women to stand guard at our churches. And while we were very appreciative of that, um, we said it's not necessary. Let's just wait and see what develops here. And as it turned out, um, the police, uh, Culver City Police Department investigated and they discovered the head, or someone discovered the head of the statue of Mary at the King Fahd Mosque. Yeah. yeah. But when, it was, when the investigation was completed, it was found that the person who did this horrible crime was someone that had been expelled from the mosque <laughs> because of their views on whatever. Anyway, and that person, thinking that they would incite animosity between the Muslim and Catholic community here, planned this whole event. So, the moral of the story is, let's not leap to conclusions about things, but let's let the, the law enforcement people uh, take um, their natural course of action, or at least make a visu visual presentation of solidarity with one another. That's perfect. But as you know that, if you want to be a Muslim, you have to believe in Christianity and Judaism. Not be a Muslim if you don't believe in whose religion. So, uh, what about the beginning of the. Oh, and the, and the beginning of Catholicism here. Certainly, in, the, uh, in certain parts of our country, um, Catholics who were, were, were discriminated against, they couldn't get jobs, couldn't do anything like this. Um, certainly, there were some very rabid anti Catholic uh, journals and newspapers, articles written. Uh, in the 1800s, uh, uh, very virulent anti-Catholic things, much as the Muslim community has experienced over the years here. Um, um, there were horrific cartoons in some uh, periodicals. There were accusations that uh, uh, 
uh, priests who are holding uh, women hostage in places and nuns were doing the same thing. All these unfabricated uh, charges against us. And it was because we were the unknown at that time, you know? We were the unknown, unknown people here. As you, Muslims have been the unknown in, most recently. And, but as Muslims are becoming more known, yeah. as Catholics became, I remember telling, maybe here actually, uh, this, we've been through this, you will go through this, but you will survive this, and you will thrive through it as the Catholic Church has thrived in this country. But we do that by standing with one another and showing solidarity with one another. First of all, as simple human, fellow human beings, deserving of our respect as a human being, regardless of differences in religion. We must not let sectarian violence, sectarian differences, cause us to, dis to fracture. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Probably maybe I'm sure that you have experience Well, I, I think it is significant that uh, we have a day like this and uh, we, that we hear from various people about um, the issues their country, their, their religions have faced in this country and other places. Um, I, I would say that um, we currently in the Jewish community are uh, facing a rise in anti-Semitism. And uh, that has a very serious um, uh, concern in the Jewish community. Um, and uh, having worked in Eastern Europe, um, I've been watching this since about the year 2011 to 2012. And um, I have a, a number of theories about whose interest stirring anti-Semitism serves. I think it's important to think about why anti-Semitism at this time, why Islamophobia at this time. Um, and yes, there is the very real hurt that Jews feel and the, the very real loss of life that has occurred. Um, so there is a, there is a, a very real issue um, but I must say, at the same time that I'm very aware of what has happened historically and in my own lifetime, um, I've been given a special antenna, so to speak, because my parents are um, survivors of two different uh, concentration camps, and I was actually born uh, in a displaced persons camp. So sometimes biography does lead you to be sensitive. Sometimes it just leads you to be more vicious. I think uh, there's no guarantee um, there. Uh, I'm also aware that uh, anti-Semitism means less to me personally than it used to. It's not that I'm indifferent. I'm, I'm not uh, foolish. Uh, I do think that if a person has uh, intentions of hate and, and th these are uh, built into their religion or their nationality or whatever system they're, they're speaking of that they need to be taken seriously. But I think for, for me as a, a religious Jew, uh, one of the questions is, is that why I'm Jewish? And I think that unfortunately, many of my fellow Jews are um, largely anti-anti-Semites. That is, when I ask them what is the positive content of your Jewish life? Is it prayer? Is it actions of uh, uh, good deeds? Uh, is it um, uh, some special way in which you uh, address uh, the special gift of life that is Jewish? I'm more and more troubled by the fact that few people can answer that question with some seriousness. So yes, we have experienced anti-Semitism. Um, um, my first day on the job as a rabbi, um, I had uh, the, that experience. And, um, these are all um, important, but they're not as important as 
uh, what it is that I want to teach my children and my uh, congregants about the meaning of how to live a Jewish life and why we are Jewish. Dr. Sanzer, please talk about your Muslim pride. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, I have experienced discrimination <clears throat> by uh, other people who call themselves Muslims. Uh, they accuse me of uh, blasphemy uh, because uh, I'm uh, too much of a Quranist. Uh, I don't go beyond that very much. Um, I think myself that I'm probably the one of the very, very few real Muslims of the times of the Prophet. And let me explain what that means. Um, Prophet Muhammad came to end uh, religious tribalism in the world. Um, the Quran, in no fewer than 36 places, called Muslims those who believe in one God. Period. Don't go any further. Uh, for those of you who want to check uh, uh, chapter 2, Bakara, I 62. God Almighty says, those who believe in one God and in the hereafter and do good unto others have to worry about nothing. Okay? And then also at the end of the same chapter 2, I have one, sorry, 285, 86. If you read those ones, it tells us that we ought to believe in all the prophets, all the books, all the angels, and I'm underlining the word all here. So once that is understood and all, there's just no room for any form of tribalism. Your religion, my religion is totally irrelevant. Now, Prophet Muhammad in his own life did the same thing. He went from uh, Mecca to a city called the Esker. In it, he established a republic. The word for republic in Arabic is Medina. Medina is not the name of a city. It's the first republic that was inclusive of all faith communities. He signed the constitution of Medina, Misak al Medina with heads of the Jewish community, the Christian community, and every other faith community. And in it, he called all of them one Ummah. Just think about that. The word Ummah includes Jews, Christians, Rastrians, anyone who believes in one God. Okay? That was called Islam. Now, for those who were believing in this new religion, for whom the book Quran was revealed, those were called Mu'minun, and everyone else who believed in one God were called Muslimun, or Muslimin and Mu'minin. Something terrible happened in the year um, 685, uh, when uh, I think the world was deprived of the greatest gift that Prophet Muhammad had given us. And that gift was that uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the Umayyad Caliph, decided that in order to increase his tax base, that the term Muslim would be applied synonymously with the word Mu'min, that Muslim would be now exclusively for, uh, used only for those who believed in the Quran. And therefore, the Jews, the Christians, the Rastrians, Sabines, and every other religious community was considered non-Muslim. So, religious tribalism came right back. And to this day, you ask around, I would say without much exaggeration, 99% of the Muslims believe that they are Muslims and that Jews are not, and that Christians are not, the Hindus are not, the Buddhists are not. In other words, 
um, religious tribalism is, full, is in full swing, and it's because of that that every uh, community of this religious tribalism, whatever their affiliation, they believe that they have a monopoly over the truth that God had sent. So if you believe that your religion is the only true religion and everybody is wrong, then yes, you can chop off the head of the statue of Mary, or you can write scribbles on the column of the Islamic Center, or you can uh, uh, do the same kind of desecration to a Jewish temple, and for that matter, any temple. And so the problem is, uh, or more so, the challenge is that we, and that is all of us, and when I say I'm a Mohammedan Christian, not post Umayyad, uh, sorry, a Mohammedan Muslim, not a post Umayyad Muslim. In that case, I'm sitting among Muslims here on this table. And I think that should be the message that we have to deliver. Now, when I told you in the beginning that I'm being discriminated against by Muslims, this is why. And I can give, give them chapter and verse from the Quran. Surah and Ayah, line by line, to prove to them that the Islam that Prophet Muhammad brought to the world community has been abandoned, unfortunately. And we went back to the Jahiliyyah in a different way, with more fervor, and we are using, and we joined religious tribalism of the time of before Prophet, and that's, I think, a great tragedy that in the last at least 15, or 1300 years, uh, we have not only abandoned the message, and as the Prophet Muhammad would say, his favorite um, prayer was, um, O God Almighty, forgive us, for we have not worshipped you the way you deserve to be worshipped. Subhanak ma'arakna. The Prophet said to God that Forgive us, for we have not been able to worship you as you deserve to be worshipped, as you deserve to be known. And my prayer is to Prophet Muhammad, forgive us that we have not learned you, uh, about you and we have not known you the way you deserve to be known. For the message that you give us, you give to humanity, and if it had succeeded, in its original form, these desecrations of places of worship would not have happened. Uh, sorry, because I told you I was a professor, right? So that, that's how lectures go. And I apologize for the lengthy time. Now we have another professor to see what he does. <laughs> so that's great. Um, I, should, I can just rest here and rely on what you said, but um, so I think that there, I agree with the basic, uh, there's a, it's talking about anti-Semitism and truth is that we talk about anti-Semitism, we talk about Islamophobia, anti-Christian hate and xenophobia in general. Um, they all come from the same place and the theological place is not recognizing that if we believe in one God, that God is the God of everyone. And everyone in, the, in my tradition, everyone is created in the image of God and everyone is worthy of God's blessing, and therefore, one has no right to discriminate against anyone else. This, um, the festival of, of Passover that we just um, came through was, celebrates the Exodus from Egypt, um, in the book of Exodus, um, and coming out of Egypt and going to Sinai, and at the revelation in Sinai, God introduces God's self by saying, I am God who took you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And what that introduction is saying is that I am God who is opposed to oppression. And the first commandment is, you shall not have any other idols before me. And the worst type of idolatry is claiming that you, one can oppress somebody else, which is what the biblical Egypt was, a notion of hierarchy notion of supremacy and one of the one of the, the major ideologies of our day is, is white supremacy is 
is called Christian nationalism. It's making a claim that one group of people is greater than any other group of people. Um, and that is flying in the face of the fact that God, if there's one God, then God is everybody's God. And the claim that God cares about me and not about you is an idolatrous claim. And so I think that that's theologically where I start thinking about anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, xenophobia. Um, but I also agree with what Rabbi Beliak said, is that we also have to think about why this kind of hatred erupted now. Who profits from it? And there are politicians and corporations and um, who, who profit from division. One of my favorite ayah in the, in the Quran is that uh, I, when Muhammad says in the name of God, I created you as tribes, and I'm gonna misquote it, I'm sorry. I created you as tribes and peoples in order to strive with each other for good. Um, and where people, what, what's going on now is that the divisions are not so that we each have our own path towards doing good in the world and justice in the world, but there are people who profit from the fact that we are divided. Right? There were people who profit, there are corporations and politicians who profit, who get power, who get money from the fact that they make us hate each other. And so it's really important to keep in mind whose interest is it, in whose interest is it, that we hate each other. Because it's not in our interest. It's not in any of our interests. Um, it, 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 it's, it is in the interest of politicians who want to stay in power, corporations who want to make money, police forces that want to have larger budgets. And I think that one thing that we can all agree on, or I hope that we can all agree on, and one of the brothers at the Islamic Center said this, is that this person who wrote on the Islamic Center, or also the person who, you know, it, is was a homeless, it was probably a homeless person. I don't know if they caught him. Yes. They caught him, homeless person, person with mental health challenges. Um, putting him in a cage is not going to solve that. It's not going to stop that. Right? If caging, if imprisonment worked, then we'd be the safest country in the world. And we're not. Um, if, you know, we think about hate crimes, Instead of thinking about hate crimes, if somebody, if somebody performs a hate crime, somebody does a hate crime, then they should have to go through a process of education, of meeting the people, of understanding the harm, understanding what people experience. But rather, we think hate crimes, oh, let's put them in a cage for a longer time. And that doesn't do anything, because when you're in a cage, you don't have to take responsibility. When you're just imprisoned, you don't have to take responsibility for what you did. You just are punished. You just are in pain yourself, and then you come out in more pain, right? And hurt people, hurt people. And so rather than that, we have to start thinking as a society about how to get out of this cycle of mass incarceration, how to get out of this cycle of thinking that the answer to everything is either a gun or a prison. And I think that when we think about Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and anti-Christian violence and all kinds of xenophobia, we have to think about education, we have to think about standing in solidarity with each other, we have to think about reaching out to each other and learning with each other. We have to stop thinking that militarized solutions like jails and police are going to solve those problems. They're not, they're like a band-aid um, when a person is dying of cancer. I'll agree with I, uh, most of the places in Utah, Salt Lake City, and I know that you had a similar problem in this country, too. Yes, actually, uh, the Latter-day Saint Church, or Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which you may have heard called the Mormons. And we were called Mormons because of a book of scripture that we have called the Book of Mormon. And there's been a play that has nothing to do with the book. We always suggest, read the book, don't go see the play. But uh, we are, have a similar background each of these uh, gentlemen here. Part of that is uh, the church was established as a restorationist church. In other words, um, a prophet was called by God by the name of Joseph Smith. And through him, 
that the truth of the gospel was revealed to him. So, you know, we, we continue to believe in the role of prophets, and we, and we honor the prophets all the way back to Abraham, back to Adam. But we have experienced the same kind of difficulties. Um, as the church began to grow, they were driven, uh, the church was established in New York, uh, then moved to Ohio. Uh, they were then driven from Ohio to Missouri, then driven from Missouri to Illinois, and then eventually were driven out of Illinois. And uh, that's how you heard about the Mormon track that took them across uh, the country, ending up in Utah. So that kind of uh, prejudice and uh, uh, driving people out because of their beliefs is something that we're familiar with. But the thing that we did learn from day one was that we had to still take the good news that we had, uh, the gospel that we wanted to share, uh, the peace and love that we believed that everyone should be aware of. And we had missionaries all over. Uh, from day one, they went into Canada, they went into uh, Great Britain, they went to the Pacific Islands. So today we have missionaries that you see walking and riding bicycles and uh, they all dress like me. And uh, <laughs> the, the point is, uh, they feel that it is their uh, responsibility to share what they can with others. And so it's not just uh, proselyting. Uh, we are greatly involved in uh, providing uh, funding and services and assistance uh, to national and international uh, issues that come up. Um, uh, so it, it, beyond a billion dollars a year goes to our services to do that. The way that we're able to do that is we, we have a uh, we have a lay ministry. So all of us are, are not paid for the work that we do in the church. Uh, I was a bishop of a congregation for five years, while at the same time working for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we learned how to juggle uh, our beliefs and our professions. But again, we are learning and have learned that the only way that we can gain acceptance in any community, in any uh, com country, is if we work with our fellow believers, those of all religions who believe that we are all children of the same God, and it is our responsibility to make sure that their lives are protected, that their rights are protected. And so one of the most common things that we're lining up with so many different religions are is uh, that our religious rights and religious freedom. And I think these types of events help us to realize how valuable that is because just as Father Alexi was talking about, when one of us is attacked, the others should be there to support one another. And this is really what uh, the truth of what, what religion really is, is to loving and serving and, and assisting others to continue their lives in peace. Thank you. I can start from Rabbi Bediak. One of the biggest problems that we have in our community is a gun violence. We have it in mosque, we have it in church, we have it in synagogue, we have it in the school, we have it in the coffee shop, we have it in the supermarket, we have it in the theater. So what is wrong and how can we solve it? What is the question I wanted to start from you? I think that uh, we need to have um, serious legislation to restrict guns um, that are not um, appropriate for someone who was um, seeking to um, have a hobby such as hunting or someone who is for some purpose that can be um, made clear the need of a gun for personal protection. Uh, I think that to, Guns, uh, again, this weekend we had two shootings. Um, uh, and we are a, a society that loves our guns. Um, apparently, um, this is written into the Bible of some people. I, I guess I, I'm gonna look for the passage, but some people believe that um, this violence is somehow to be ignored and um, to be explained away. 
Um, the violence that we've experienced uh, is a reflection uh, of many other kinds of violence. Um, it's just that we've allowed children uh, and mentally uh, challenged people to own guns. Um, I grew up in a, a place where there were lots of gun, guns. I uh, um, grew up in a place called Arizona. It's the next state over. Um, and already as a, a young person, I was aware of the problem of guns and gun culture. Um, and um, I, myself, at the age of 16, uh, when I had my first jalopy, traveled around with a loaded 22 rifle in the back of my trunk. It was just part of the culture. Um, and in a sense that um, carelessness of youth, uh, here comes another panel member. We want to call attention to the fact that he's arriving quietly and no one is noticing that he's arriving, um, coming across intrusively, yes. And I'm on the wrong side. Welcome, welcome. Um, so, gun violence um, must be addressed by a number of means. Not only laws that prohibit guns, but uh, a larger question about how did we get to, to again, this, this um, uh, fear that uh, requires everyone to think they need a gun, um, and so forth. I know of no other country in the world where this problem exists, and um, I have to say that there's a strong correlation between certain religious groups and their um, fascination with guns. I will point to the Jewish group, uh, because they are the ones that are closest to me. Uh, there was a group, and still is existence, that has had as its theme every Jew of 22. Um, I met many of their adherents when I was a prison chaplain. They were there uh, for very serious crimes. Um, one of the things I noticed about them is that many of them were uh, not very well educated. Uh, many of them had been raised on a diet of hate. Uh, and it, this had been ignored by their teachers and had been fostered by people who thought that they could control the haters. Um, so the gun violence issue is um, something that is tearing our nation apart. And I, I see no other possibility than a very serious commitment. And um, I would say that um, this is one of those issues where if people are um, trafficking in guns, um, associating with uh, politicians that are looking the other way, that this is a reason not to vote for them and to drop them out of the political system. No, it's your turn. But let me uh, mention something. I want to appreciate what the gentleman in the audience, my friend, Mr. Shantivas and Shoi. His father passed away this evening today, and his dedication is to the center is enough to be here among us. Can you stand up? Our condolences. Thank you. Dr. Sanzer, is it going to be a professor talking about the gun violence? I'm just wondering how did we get to, from God to gun? This is the way it is in this community. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think we have a, we have been told, in other words, our culture has been defined to think that um, you have to have a gun to be an American. Um, and it's unfortunate uh, when the Constitution says that you have the right to bear arms, I thought they meant to the arms left and right, right? And it makes perfect sense. Uh, but uh, not so. 
So uh, after the not so civil civil war, uh, when the African Americans uh, were no longer slaves, but still there were not enough laws to protect them, they start uh, keeping guns because that was their only defense. So black America felt that they needed to have guns. Then white America came and said, oh, oh, that's wrong. We are not a civil society if everybody's going to carry guns. So they made sure that the, white, the blacks did not carry guns. And a hundred or so years later, the whole thing is turned on its head. Uh, the problem is that there are serious contradictions in some of the arguments that I hear from the gun lobbyists or those who support them. Um, one is um, that those who support gun ownership are also pro-life. And the contradiction is that if you don't want a life to be aborted because you're so pro-life, then why do you want to make everything possible for that life to be killed only a few years after in Sandy Hooks and in all the kindergarten and schools and everywhere? So those who are at the same time claiming that life is important are doing everything to make, make sure that life is not treated with any sense of importance. And Rabbi mentioned of the two uh, shootings this week. Sorry, there were three. One happened today. So uh, there's no end to it. I, I wrote uh, in, uh, I think, uh, Huffington Post a few years back that gun ownership does not befit a civil society. And I still believe in that. Uh, I think we are taken hostage uh, by the gun manufacturers and by the gun lobbyists. And if you look at it in a more sensible way, gun is the only instrument that when it is used properly, it kills. <laughs> when it's used properly, it kills. Well, think about it being used improperly. It's even worse. And um, the other problem that probably goes along with it is the the obsession with gun ownership, not only by individuals, but also our institutions, such as the police. The police used to be for, uh, you know, uh, crowd control. They were supposed to make sure that the slaves didn't run away. They were not meant to be a police, but that mentality spread out in a way that now they are part of the civil society. And uh, how many times have you heard on the radio or on, seen on TV that police officers have shot innocent people when they were running away from them? I was once in uh, Holland many years ago. Uh, in a bank, we wanted to exchange money. Uh, we didn't have the internet and all that stuff. And then uh, somebody said, oh, uh, there's a holdup in the same bank where my wife and I were standing. So um, one of the officials of the bank came and apologized. He said, if you can wait outside, we will serve you, but just give us a few minutes. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, it's a, it's a hold up, and we are supposed to wait outside, and they're gonna help us? Well, a few, uh, a few minutes later, we saw there was a, a police car, a small, Folks like that, with that little beeping thing, they parked very far away from the bank, and we could see them there from the side, the, from the river bank there. And they were wearing like you know sweaters and things. They didn't look like the police we are used to here. And they came and they were talking, and then they knocked on the door. They went into the bank, and we thought like, wait a minute, there would be some shooting and the whole thing. No. They talked to the man. They took him out of the line in a very nice way. They talked to him, you know, what was his complaint? What was his problem? And he said, whatever the complaint was. So the whole thing, like maybe in about 10, 15 minutes, there was therapy, there was treatment, 
and uh, man was helped the way he wanted it, and then we went back and we did our own business. And I, I was just like, wait a minute, aren't police supposed to have guns? Aren't they supposed to enter a bank or a building with guns drawn and finger on the trigger and the whole thing? That, uh, I, I, I don't have the right word for it. I think so long as we are so obsessed with guns, we do not qualify as a civil society. Compare our uh, death rate from guns with, with Japan, with many other societies that we sort of look down upon them, but in reality, they can teach us something, but only if we can end this hostage taking by the gun lobby. Thank you. Actually, in Japan, they make a homemade car, and they kill the privates there. And they said that they had a homemade bomb for the Prime Minister was speaking. I think we gave them an idea with it at Hiroshima. Rabbi <laughs> Kono. Yes, sir. Okay. What you say it reminds me of when uh, Gandhi was asked what he thought of Western civilization, and he said that would be a good idea. So I think we have a problem in this country. The Second Amendment seems to undermine our claim to be a, a nation under God. It's hard to uh, make the claim that we're a nation of people of faith if embedded in our Constitution is the right for everybody to have a weapon, to have a weapon, a weapon of destruction, especially guns. Um, and I think that, I mean, as, as the professor just mentioned, today in Kansas City, a 16-year-old black boy, Carl Yarrow, Carl, um, Ralph, I'm sorry, Ralph Yarrow, was shot on the porch of a man's house because he rang the bell and he was at the wrong address. He mixed up the address. I just did this a couple weeks ago and it was the wrong address. When rang the bell, luckily nobody was home, so I went across the street. But here, the person came and shot him, a white man, shot him through a glass door. And then, he was on the ground, Ralph, and the man came out, obviously saw he was unarmed, and shot him again. The man was taken in by police and immediately released, because they have standard ground laws in Kansas. So we are in a place where we have laws that protect people who shoot other people, while at the same time, we're getting rid of laws that allow people access to health care, access to bodily autonomy, access to information and education. Kansas has one of the lowest um, amounts of money that's given to education, to healthcare in the, in the country. So, the, we are, there's a problem. There are 400 million guns in private ownership in the United States. That means that every single person in the United States could be killed by a different weapon, and there would still be about almost 100 million weapons left over. There's no excuse for that. There's no excuse for that. The term gun culture, that in certain parts of the country there is a gun culture, reminds me of when in, during the Jim Crow South, people would argue that lynching was part of the culture. Killing is not a culture, it's murder. And enabling people to have weapons of mass destruction, enabling the, again, who benefits from this? The gun companies who make AR-15s, which is a lightweight weapon, which as we saw in Ubalde, can be wielded by somebody who bought it a couple of weeks before, and who bought it probably in some part because he saw it on these video games where gun companies advertise their guns we are in a serious spiritual crisis. 
a serious spiritual crisis. We cannot claim to be a nation which is trying to create a, a, a faithful society, a just society, and have 400 million guns in private hands, which ends up in a 16-year-old being shot because he rang the doorbell in the wrong house, and the shooter being let off. Having a mass shooting just about every week, and sometimes more than once a week. And so I have to say, as Lloyd Garrison said about enslavement, the Constitution, this, this part of the Constitution just has to go. I think that we can get there slowly, perhaps, by enacting strict gun control, but there should not be a right to own a gun. No other civilized country has a constitutional right to own a gun. personal experience, but I'll get to it in a minute. I think our role as believers are to be peacemakers. Uh, and part of what we need to do is find a way to change the hearts and minds of society. We have to learn to reject the portrayal of violence in our movies, on our television. Uh, the anger and the hatred that is uh, so often uh, spewed uh, in the public uh, places. And the only way that that can be done is if we work together to look for opportunities to change local and national laws and get people to think better of one another, to love one another. That's the hardest road, but that's the only way that this is really going to be solved. Uh, I saw evidence of this uh, last year. Uh, I have an, an older brother <clears throat> who, uh, as a young man, was kind of enamored with guns. Uh, he joined the Marine Corps when he graduated high school, uh, became a, uh, uh, a Marine and, and served in the uh, reserve. But he kept guns as a hobby, uh, but I remember going with him when he would go and practice. Well, over the years, uh, he also started buying into some of the more uh, common uh, anger uh, political dialogue that we've all been exposed to. And so what happens is when people start to hate other races or other religions or other groups of people, uh, they feel that they are entitled to take whatever action they have to to stop what they feel is the evil in the world. And when the frustration gets to a point where they start, as we all know, as people become more hateful, uh, there becomes mental illness setting in. To, well, to, to the point that they do not really uh, act in a way that a thinking person would. Well, this is what happened to my brother. Uh, he became an angry person. Uh, he was getting older, his health was failing. He blamed everyone else around him. Uh, fortunately, he didn't try to take his anger on anyone else, but he got to the point where he was just so frustrated with life, he took his own life. Well, this didn't solve any problem. Uh, all he did, he just fell victim to the mindset and the, and the uh, societal norms that we've accepted that uh, a gun is a solution, and it isn't. And uh, uh, I, I don't have a problem with the Second Amendment, but the problem is it has become something different entirely. As someone previously mentioned, it's almost become a religion. And uh, I, I believe that we, as those who follow God and are his children, we do all that we can to find a way to change the minds and hearts of others so that the hatred does not take over and that weapons are not a solution to a conflict. Uh, never mind. Check it out now. So you have to hear that. You have to hear that. Whoever comes late pays for the dinner. Huh? Whoever comes late for pays for the dinner. Yeah. All these people are going to You better hope somebody else comes late. I got a for I left my card at home. Before you uh, start, before, and some problem with the speakers, before people bombard me with criticism that, boy, you have all the main people and the uh, uh, 
Tanya and no woman be invited as Isa Hassan. His uh, son was graduating this afternoon. I invited the lady rabbi and he couldn't make it. So unfortunately, you know, fortunately, most of the religious leaders are being invited the whole month of Ramadan to their start in different months, including Father Alice. Okay, you missed the first part, that's, uh, you will miss it very well, and you can hear that part in the YouTube, but I you very regret that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Could, you, could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> What's the reason for God murders? And what, uh, what can we do to control that? I think that you should send your public anyway. My name is uh, Umar Hakim. Well, first of all, Asalaamu Alaikum. My name is Umar Hakim Day. I'm the founder of Encourage Foundation. Let me see, six people in here for a second. So, one out of seven people believe in guns. I hate to bust you, but I'm going to push back a little bit. So, um, by show of hands, who knows of John Jane Elliott? Who have heard of Jane Elliott? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question. By a show of hands, who in this room would trade places with the African American community? With the African American community? By a show of, I'm gonna repeat it again. By a show of hands, who in this room will, 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 will trade places with the African American community? I got one person. Two. So, okay. By the, so that knows. So that means you. So that means you know it's a problem. Yeah. It's definitely a problem. Um, the one time in my history was the Black Panther Party. You heard of the Black Panther Party? Yeah. This was a unit of black men who read the laws, who knew, who, who stood by their Second Amendment right. And this was the one time in history that the police, law enforcement, did not come after us because there was a fear of a black man with a gun. So in the community that I grew up in, that they tell you to turn in your guns, but then they come draw guns upon you and come get you. So my heart goes out to all the mass, to all the victims of the mass shooting. My heart goes out to everyone who was killed in the, in, in, to all police officers who was killed in the line of duty. My heart goes out to um, to any to all the all, all the gang life that I've seen in Compton, California. My heart goes out to the people, but I own a gun. I own a couple of guns. And for the reason for my self-defense, because I know. I'm looking in my history when the oppressor tells me to turn in my gun, when they come to my house, they're gonna draw a gun on me. So I believe that there should be stronger gun laws. I I took the test when you go to um when you go to buy your gun. I took it's a 21 to a question test. And they bet you real hard on this test. I barely passed. And I just believe that it should be sh more stricter gun laws on who gets one, who don't, and who gets one, and who shouldn't get one. Because the country that I live in has been very oppressive. I'm not in love with my oppressor. I don't have Stockholm syndrome at all. And if you come, and if you come at me wrong, if you transgress my limits, then we have another conversation. That's just basic need. So if you look anywhere in the world, any of them, somebody said if you look anywhere else in the world, that these countries can teach us the lesson, which is true. I've been to the UK. The police officers, they call the bodies, they do not carry pistols at all. You know, um, the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. The United States has the lowest education uh, rate in the world. The United States has the lowest healthcare system in the world. The United States has the lowest of everything in the world. So they, they painted a, a picture that this is the best country in the world. When you have 
other countries who has a beautiful model of coexisting with each other the problem that i have that the stakeholders of this country never believe in coexisting with the globe now we got brits upon us so i'm about to finish no, go ahead. okay go ahead. so um the stakeholders of this country do not believe in coexistence my mother's from south africa my mother is from um south america my wife is from south africa They uh, constantly have you seen Europeans get off the boat and shoot first. Why should I trust you? Why do you open your mouth? Now, I'm not saying all white people are like this. I don't believe that. I know some good white folks who can do some good work out here. But, but when you look at my history, my history, when you look at King Leopold II, what he did to the Congolese's. You know, when little chocolate hands that they sell in Belgium? That was, that's mimicking the hands that he cut off of African slaves who did not bring back the produce or the production from the fields. So when I saw that they gave me some chocolate hands as a gift, I threw mine away. So all I'm saying is, from my history, my history is different from theirs, I don't see nothing wrong with it. But I do see something wrong with how they're letting 15 year olds um, get guns. That's the story that they tell us. I want to know who gave that 15 year old the money to go get the gun. Because an AR 15 costs anywhere from 1500 and above. Who gave this 18 year old money to go get a gun? Somebody. So there's another story to that. So at the end of the day, for me, I only speak for myself and not everybody here. It should be way stronger gun laws. Way stronger gun laws. Because it's not easy getting one, but if you're under 15, I believe you can go, to, you used to be able to go to a, uh, a, a, a like big bottom buy a shotgun. Now you can't. So it's, it's a lot that we have to look at. I think you mentioned that. Um, Violence has been in American entertainment. Um, it's been in it's been in the music, especially rap music. I'm not going to front. Rap music have a lot of ropes in it about gun violence, but you got to understand why. Last story: My auntie stayed on 113th and went, and across the street from my house was a vacant field where the train came through. Well, I here, I remember this. The train used to just come and stop and leave cars right there. So when nighttime come, the neighborhood they get curious. What's in the what's in the cars? Train full, train full of guns. Unlocked. True story. And, and why it's 1970. Somebody wanted us to do something with those guns and we fell for the lie. I, I, I will I, I will have to take accountability of that. But all I'm saying is, you know, we know your history, and this country has a, a, a cold violence with guns. And even when Rosewood, when they um, came into Rosewood, the reason why the Klan turned around because of, because of um, African Americans was, was armed, were armed. So, you know, um, I am in favor of stronger gun laws, but I do not believe that you should just take them away because this is one of the reasons why the United States has never got invaded, because they know that everybody has a gun. You know, recently, uh, Corin, Corin Newsom had an interview and he said that the 10 states who are the, who have the highest number of the mass shooting for the red people, red states. Oh, can I say something quick? It's okay. <laughs> so, whenever you hear black on black crime, that's a lie. What is white on white crime? What is brown on brown crime? So whenever you hear this statistic, 
Statistics, the police saying, well, because of black on black crime, okay, what is white on white crime? Thank you. That was good. That was good? Yeah. Okay, I had to make up because I was late, bro. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Omar for sharing his story with us. I think it's a daughter speaking to the people to the outside. Okay. So again, thank you, Omar, for, for your sharing. Um, I think I'd like to say two things. I think some of my fellow panelists here has referred to a spiritual crisis, and I think that's exactly what we're facing now. Oh, this is the Protestant mic, I see. Okay. <laughs> um, some of my fellow panelists refer to a spiritual crisis, and I think that's exactly what we're facing here. I think that we have lost in this country the respect for human life, period. Every human life needs to be respected. The fact that someone can come to your door and uh, then be blown away. It's just unthinkable, unthinkable. It's not the fact that people go to schools and just blow kids away, unthinkable. Where's the respect for human life here? Um, and we can go on and on and on. So I think that's what would be the challenge for religious leaders to try to once again instill in our populace a basic respect for human life, period. Um, secondly, there was some mention of institutional responsibility here, and um, this might be a bit sensitive, but driving here this afternoon on the 405 freeway coming north here, I saw a rather challenging billboard that said, maybe you saw it, Linda, as well, um, do your churches need armed guards? Our synagogues do. Now, I understand that sense of security, perhaps, um, but I cannot envision uh, Catholic churches, for example, hiring armed guards to be on their premises. I remember in El Segundo, where I lived, one of the, the pastors there in a, a, a church told me that they were considered, seriously considering hiring armed guards to be at their church. And I find this just appalling that a house of worship would have um, visibly armed guards uh, present there. Now again, I understand the Jewish situation, Jewish sensitivities here, but I still think that it, it's not helping the situation to uh, not to, not to be um, presenting a respect for uh, one another. I don't know, maybe you have an answer to that? So actually, I, I agree with you. I think it, I think the Jewish community has a problem. I agree with Umar also, so I'm finding myself disagreeing with myself. Um, so I, I, I think that the Jewish community really does have an armed guard problem. Because having armed security does more than people want a false sense of security. A friend of mine just said, we're never absolutely safe. Americans have this false illusion that there's a place of zero risk. There is no place of zero risk. But the problem with armed guards on synagogues, and I think it's on all places of worship, is, is that it's a teaching moment. When our congregants come in, when our kids come in, when it's teaching that everybody outside is dangerous. When we're trying to teach that we should um, have s solidarity between communities, when we're trying to teach that actually safety is in solidarity, what we're actually teaching is that we have to harden our target, right? We have to be better armed, and that's not good for anybody, aside from the fact that we're also, rather than teaching um, that, you know, the basic righteousness of all people, we're teaching the, that we should be suspicious of all people, right? And we 
end up profiling people and we end up relying on guns and guards rather guns, guards and gates rather than relying on reaching out to our neighbors, especially synagogues and mosques. No. All right, we're back. <laughs> Especially synagogues, mosques, and churches that are in the city. allows us to think that we're not part of the city. So the houselessness problem is not our problem. So the, the violence problem outside the, you know, is not our problem because everything's safe inside, which is just, again, an illusion. Um, and I have to, I want to thank Umar for what, what he said, because gun control in California didn't come out of any altruistic reason. It was totally racist. It was after the Black Panthers went up to Sacramento um, that, Reagan, this, uh, Reagan passed gun control. Reagan introduced gun control, and it was run on purely racist grounds, and that's totally true. Um, I think there's a whole other discussion about what happens when you know, a justifiable understanding of oppression ends up in, a, in an arms race. Um, but I don't want to take away from the fact that that's a real problem in this country. Who is guarding the guard? That's a good question. Who is guarding the armed guard? Yeah. I mean, I mean, we have to also take into account that we hire armed guards at you know usually minimum wage to get killed. Okay. That's that's what we do. We hire armed guards to get killed for us. Yeah. Thank you. You want to say anything? Yes. Omar? I know. <laughs> say that one too. Um, um, there is, they said a, a, a spiritual, what was the crisis? There's no spiritual crisis in my heart. I know what, I know what earth I'm in. Can you get the mic up to please? Oh, there's no spiritual crisis in my heart because I know what earth I'm in, I know what city I live in. Um, <clears throat> the latest human realistic statistics says that um, African Americans are 9% of LA County's population, but we are 46% of hate crimes in, um, in Los Angeles. So I know where I'm at. I know what's going on. We have two armed guards at our gate. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I want to applaud the Jewish community because they have like the top security. And I've been anywhere. You know what I'm saying? You got to check on your ID. I think, and that's what we're trying to model. They have great security. And if you know the history of Islam in America, we've always had great security from the Nation of Islam up until now. Great security. Those men who's marched up and down the streets, they took care of our streets and marched and pulled people out the streets into the mosques because they look, because who are these men come in our community with suits on and empowering the children to sell candy. So for me, I have no spiritual crisis in my heart, but because I know what times that we live in. And, and again, I believe God tells us, you know, um, you have the right to defend yourself. You know, the earth is for the strong. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's this verse in the Quran. It says, the power on which my Lord has established me is better than that tribute. So help me, therefore, with strength and labor, I will erect a barrier between you and them. So with the leadership that's at this table, we need your help. We need your help to vote in the right direction because 2024 is coming up and they're going to be asking you for your own endorsement. But you have to make sure whoever comes into your community aligns with your community values. If you cannot support me on A, B, and C, that's why I want the George Floyd Act to be um, become law. Because too many times have we been shot down by some 
uh, um, police officer or anybody who's having a bad time at home. I'm tired of hearing the story. Oh, he has mental health. Oh, he um, he's going through something. But as soon as a black man show up to somebody's door, bang, bang. So 2024 is coming up. Pay attention to the elections. Be mindful of who you voting for because they have to meet our values. So we at this table, we need your help in organizing our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the next question I'm going to start from Dr. Zaman. From the time that we start being involved with the interfaith relationship and before, what do you think changes happen to your life? I think nothing. <laughs> yeah, but, well, uh, here's the thing, I think uh, some of this ties up, but if I can just make a quick comment on, um, on the gun issue, and I'll get back to this question is that when I was little, I would see these birds in the tree, and they would all be telling each other things that I couldn't understand. Then I found a bird dictionary. And it said that each of the birds is telling the other one to shut up. <laughs> so by screaming at someone to silence, you're not creating silence, you're creating more noise. There are societies where guns are not part of it and life is okay. Uh, we humans were not born with guns. My solution for guns is that guns should be prohibited all together, zero. So when blacks don't have guns, white don't have guns, and browns don't have guns, that is the only way where the equalization will be more realistic. The way things are going on now is that everybody is buying more guns and more powerful guns, and a recent study by the University of Washington said that because they use the nine uh, caliber, nine millimeter caliber, whatever the term is, that uh, more people are dying from gunshots because they can't even make it to the hospital. Now, uh, if you look at the world politics, you can see that the number one, two, three exporters of guns which is what kills people in the third world, are the countries that consider themselves the beacons of democracy. The United States is at the top. So people in those countries also die because of guns. So that's why I think, I told you before, it's the only instrument that, when used properly, kills. If we prohibit the production and make it just totally illegal, no guns, that's the equalizer. But the underlying factor is, now to get to the correct uh, uh, issue, is that um, I think we do call ourselves uh, civilized, but after I tell you what I'm going to tell you, you will reconsider that. I think we are too, uh, we are going against the flow of nature. Uh, Nature and God has created us to be different. You will not find a thing. You will not find two things anywhere in nature. Flowers, plants, trees, birds, whatever. That they are exactly the same. So God creates us to be different. And what do we do? We want to make everyone same. They have to be our race to be accepted. They were have to be our religion to be accepted. They will be from other country. They have to speak our language. Just look around the world, what are they fighting over? They are fighting over difference because we can't tolerate difference. Difference is natural. You go to a garden, you won't find flowers that, are, that look exactly the same. You look at an artist's painting. Imagine if someone painted a whole canvas of exactly the same color and put it in a museum, how many people will stop by? If a painting had, it was all red or all green, it is not a painting unless there is a difference in it. So on this canvas of humanity, the hand of the artist God is painting us different. And no matter how much we claim to be godly and religious and spiritual and all those other things, we are doing exactly the opposite. 
we are intolerant of human difference, which is as natural as the difference of everything else on the face of Earth and in the cosmos too. So we have to become civilized in the most meaningful way, which is that difference is beauty. Difference is beauty. Whether it's the difference of race, religion, the way we worship. You know, uh, in Islam there are five schools of um, jurisprudence, and each one prescribes a different kind of prayer. You have to hold your hands, uh, you know, hanging hands and all that stuff. I do all of them, deliberately, to defy them. And that's why I say, I do not have a, to use the, this, the word for a sect, I say, I, I do not have a sect. <laughs> that's see the objection, everyone. <laughs> uh, let me repeat it, see if it happens again. So I say, I do not have a sect. I have a religion. I do not have a religion. I have a God. So if we really worship God, then let's not create any veil in between. Religions are a problem. Sorry, I mean, this is probably the wrong place to say that. Religions are a problem because of the way we use them. Because we create them as walls of division. Of, of creating more difference. How do you worship God? And if you worship it different, uh, differently than I do, then you're wrong. And then my belief is, you know, worship God in any way you want to. That's what the Quran says. In any way you want to. And so our problem is that we do not accept the difference, in, especially in, in difference of religion. And, and I think the way we could survive better is to become natural. And the natural is to not be just tolerant of the difference, no. Tolerance implies that there is a, a hidden underlying intolerance, no. Acceptance, even that is um, to me not good enough. I think we have to appreciate, we have to see uh, difference as beauty, as the different pigments uh, on our skin, whether they are the brush strokes on a painting, whether they are the petals of flowers in a garden, difference is beauty. And if we can appreciate difference and live it and believe in it, well, probably not all the problems will be solved. But thank then, you. Many of them will be. Thank you. I'm not going to ask any more questions. <laughs> Rabbi Cohen, what was, what's your reaction? You didn't answer my question, Dr. Zamor. Sorry? You didn't answer my question. No, no, I did. No? OK, that's OK. OK, so, so Go ahead. just so I don't run into the same issue, what, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I believe that you are involved, all of you who are sitting here, involved in the interfaith relationship. Yes, and you're active. But I want to know how your life will change from the time that you started this and the time before that. Okay. Um, so even though I have a great desire to go back to the previous conversation, I won't. <laughs> yeah, the gun control is not going to stop anything. Um, no, so I, I, I can actually map in my own biography from when I got involved in interfaith, or multi-faith, both conversations and engagement and activism. Um, and at that time, my life, from that time, my life was, was wildly enriched. First of all, my mind was open. Um, I you know growing up, growing up in the United States in a minority religion, a very small minority religion. So I knew about Christianity and kind of general terms. Um, I didn't know anything about Islam um, growing up. And so understanding, first of all, that Bible stories, which I assume, which you know, obviously Christians and Jews share, some of them, um, Muslims don't share the same Bible stories. And that was, kind of, that was a revelation for me. Um, 
the same time, you know, so things, a lot of things along those lines. On the other hand, um, Jews and, and Muslims share law, which Jews and most Christians don't share. Um, and so that was also another way of reframing my experience of the world, or my experience of, of the world. And then, you know, there's, there is an importance, and I've worked with a, um, an organization called Clue Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice for, for years, I've been chair of the board for a little while. Um, and their slogan is, all religions demand justice. Which is true. Um, and it, the slogan is used for good ends. This morning I was on a picket line down at um, a company that produces food for the airlines and spoke to um, a group of workers, mainly Christians, um, bought them a good word, a Jewish word. Um, but every what's what's more interesting to me, what's more beautiful to me, to use your term, is that each every religion understands justice in a little different way, and the way to get from here to there. And that's not bad. That's a good thing. Um, to have all these different paths to God is wonderful. And I think the paths are important. And here, I might push back on what you're saying. Um, there is a rabbinic teaching that the, the, the story in Exodus about the revelation says that, that at a certain point, the Israelites said to Moses, we don't want to hear God. We want you to mediate between us and God because we're scared. And one good thing, you know, in the middle of the desert, God was a pretty powerful guy, and these people are just coming out of slavery. Um, so you speak to God and then tell us what God said. And the rabbi said that later on in, in the book of Deuteronomy, God says that that was good. And one might think, why was it that that, that was a good path? that the Israelites didn't want to hear the voice of God, but rather they wanted to hear it mediate. And the rabbis ask that question, and they say it's because if the Israelites had heard the truth from the mouth of God, that would have been it. They, they wouldn't have been able to think anything else, they wouldn't have been able to create anything else, because that's it, the ontological ultimate. God said this. But, since there was the mediation of Moses, that was the space for tradition. That was the space for interpretation. And interpretation is the lifeblood of religion. And different interpretations, first of all, internally in Judaism, there are, there's a saying that there are 70 faces to the Torah. There's another tradition that says there are 2,000 faces to the Torah. Interpretation is the way we get close to, but never arrive at God. And then the different interpretations that are brought out by the different religions. Um, and so, engaging with other faiths, with other religions, um, can only enrich one's understanding of the various paths available to God, the various paths available to creating justice in the world. And so multi-faith engagement, multi-faith living in a multi-faith world, and one of the things I love about Los Angeles is that it is so diverse, so multi-faith, so, you know, and, you know, once one gets out of the Abrahamic religions, there are many non-Abrahamic religions that are represented in, in Los Angeles, which are also mind-blowing in terms of thinking about what it means to be a religious person or a person of faith in the world. And so, I, I, I think that one, of the, that one of the gifts of my life has been to be part of um, multi-faith spaces. Thank you, Rabbi. Elder Greer? Well, obviously, uh, the two great commandments are to love God and to love your fellow men. And uh, it becomes easy to love God when you get to know him through the teachings and the commandments that he gives us living them. Well, the same thing is true. We can't really love our brothers and sisters if we don't know them. And so interfaith gives us that freedom to get to know people on what they love and what's important to them. We understand why they believe the way they believe. We appreciate it. We can love them because of what they believe. It doesn't matter that it might not be the same as me. But that 
that's one of the first things I learned when was my interface in Cambridge. And I think uh, if we can continue to push this, uh, if we continue to give that example to others, if we can get outside of our comfort zone. Uh, I talked briefly uh, earlier about how Latter-day Saints were driven and settled in Salt Lake. Well, that was a situation where, yeah, you can get along with yourselves if you all believe the same thing. The challenge was to open up and put yourself out there with others who don't think or believe like you do. And I think the only happiness you'll find in life is loving others, serving them, and becoming more like uh, God expects us to be. Well, no, uh, I'll break on. Um, the question is, how did interfaith change your life? Yes. Okay. So in 1997, I received my first Quran on the job as a cable man. And what Rabbi, what my rabbi said that, you know, it was the people who chose to want me to lead me. So we know that the Quran, this the month of Ramadan is about when the Quran was first revealed through Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in the cave. And it came directly through Jibril to, to Muhammad. May peace and blessings be upon him. So when the sister handed me my first Quran, and I started reading, you know, the, the Quran is known as the speech of Allah. This is direct revelation from the creator himself. So when I, I read, so this is one of the verses that I read in the book that kind of woke me up. You feel me? So, Bismillah. The same religion has he established for you as, as that which he's enjoined on Noah, that which we have sent by inspiration to thee, and that which we have enjoined on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Namely, that ye should remain steadfast in religion and make no divisions therein. To those who worship other things in Allah, hard is the way to which thou callest them. Allah chooses for himself whom he pleases and guides to himself whom he who turns to him. So when I read verses like this, coming from where, and then don't get don't get me wrong, I only come from a bad home. My mother, rest in peace, worked. She retired as a, as a nurse manager from the county of Los Angeles. She has a beautiful home. I could, my yard has flowers, about, about, about like six different colored roses that I have to take care of. So I didn't come from a bad home, but when she was at work, I was in the element. I had to be home by 3.30 because she get off at she get off at 3, so I made sure I was home at 3.30. But in that time that she was absent, I was in the element. And when I started reading verses like this in the Quran, it started ripping out the hatred in me. It started making me look at these men differently. It started me, it started, um, and then with the former job that you have serving the homeless. When you on Skid Row and you see not only because uh, African Americans come through the line, but white folks come through the line, Jewish people come through the line, Christian people come through the line. Every single saved person coming through this line asking for help. How can I be? How can I be some type of uh, racist person against this person who's seeking just a glass of water? So when I started reading the Quran, it opened my heart and my mind to shape my previous prejudices that I grew up with, that I learned in my school book. Just to let you know. I learned in my, in my class texts, McCollum McGraw, my, every time they showed the African society, showed a rural person. You feel me? So, Islam, um, a lot of speech of the Christ definitely opened my heart to where it's now I'm at the table. Where if, you, if, you, if you talk to my homies, they'd be like, what type of work you do? I, I, I chill with my people. Who's your people? These are my people. These are my folks, you know what I'm saying? So definitely um, Islam has opened my heart, you know, to be, I guess pluralistic is the word, you know what I'm saying? To be more open and thoughtful about man. Should I ask him about the lunar months? What? Lunar months. <laughs> oh, oh, don't bring that conversation up again. <laughs> 
you had this conversation on the radio show. You should go and study about that. Thank you. Father Alex. You know, I've been the uh, ecumenical and interreligious officer for the Archdiocese since the year 2000. And when I was uh, pushed to take this job, I didn't want it. I absolutely did not want it. Because I was a little bit narrow. A little bit narrow. But over these what, 23 years now, um, I have uh, tried to live what Miroslav Wolf describes uh, interfaith relations as an embrace. What do you do when you embrace someone? You open your arms, right? You put your arms around someone. What you're doing actually is making room for them in you. And that's what exactly what I've uh, uh, encountered and been enriched by my relationships with uh, everyone of different faiths. I certainly would not have had that experience had I not taken this position. And I, I, my challenge is to provide that type of opportunity for other members of the Catholic Church and other religions and to have a similar idea of being not tolerating one another, but being enriched by the other and experience other people's approach to the divine. Thank you. Rabbi Betty. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very moved by what I've learned from each and every one of the people that have spoken. Uh, I began my rabbinate um, as the first chaplain at the Claremont Colleges uh, when they uh, decided to have a Catholic chaplain, a Jewish chaplain, and a, of course they had had for years a Protestant chaplain. So um, it was built into my definition of, as my, for my job. We were supposed to talk to each other. And um, there was a great deal of uh, things that I learned about um, what I thought was a fairly well educated, open-minded, person myself uh, that was not so well educated and not so open-minded. Um, some of the earliest lessons were the struggles that had produced things like Vatican II uh, and what that meant. I won't go through an entire list, but it is clear to me that at this point, now it's uh, 52 years since I took my first job as a rabbi and the interfaith chaplaincy, that whatever interfaith meant, um, that is today something that is, again, not fully understood. Um, I don't think most Jews, or most Catholics for that matter, know anything about something like Vatican II and what that meant. Uh, and I could take a long, um, a very long discourse about what did it mean in my uh, growing up uh, as a professional rabbi to understand that uh, the inclusion of women within Judaism and the inclusion of women within so many other faiths and so many parts of life were uh, vital to the future of our communities. Well, I, I actually have had one particular image, a colleague of mine who still lives in Los Angeles. Uh, we've been rabbis together, we've gone to rabbinical school together, and all of a sudden I looked over and I noticed that that rabbi was pregnant. Uh, I was shocked um, because we had treated each other uh, rather clearly as colleagues, but all of a sudden, I had to acknowledge not only the commonalities that we had, but the differences that we faced. And sometimes I think when we do the interfaith work, we run to, to tell everybody, oh, we're all alike, we have so much that's similar, uh, without stopping to understand the complexities of how people got to where they are. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, as the first chaplain to the Muslim students at the Claremont Colleges. 
It was an experience because I really didn't know anything. Uh, no one had bothered to educate me about Muslims, about anything about the, uh, the, the culture. And I think about how far we've come in American culture that we can even have the beginning conversations. We're, we're still a long way to go. So on and so forth with every issue um, that has come to symbolize for me uh, an open heart and an open mind toward appreciating not just kind of a, a grudging, oh, this is another human being. But this is a human being with a very specific past and a very specific um, uh, set of aspirations. Um, and so uh, I take interfaith as kind of the thing we were supposed to do from the beginning um, as human beings. Um, and then we somehow lost our way. And this is a way of recovering our task of rediscovering how wonderful the human race is in all its diversity. Um, I hope that we will also take care of the um, place that we call Mother Earth uh, to discover its needs for, for care as well as a co collective communal project. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. I would like to ask the distinguished panelists to sit there and take a break. People exhale a little bit. And we have some distinguished guests who are invited to come and say a few words. I start with Councilman, I hope I say it right. Councilwoman Katie Doklotsky. Was it right? Close. Good <laughs> one. I'll take it. Councilwoman Raman did the same thing with my name. Hi. <laughs> I also hope that everyone had a joyous Easter and Passover last week. That's just beautiful. I'm so glad I came a couple minutes before I could speak. Uh, earlier today, I, I attended um, the Holocaust Museum LA's Yom HaShoah commemoration of, of the Holocaust. And I can't help but think if we had had more conversations like the one we're having here tonight, we could have avoided a lot of death and destruction. And so I'm just, I'm so glad that I started my day there and, and ending it here. Uh, it seems fitting that we're coming together for a unity celebration less than a week after Easter and Passover, uh, and just a few days until Eid al-Fitr. It's rare that some of the holiest days of the year for each of the Abrahamic faiths are observed so closely together. Uh, my family and I are Jewish and observed Passover with friends and family this last week. Uh, Passover celebrates when the Israelites escaped slavery in Egypt. And one of the most important lessons we're taught as Jews during Passover comes from Leviticus 19.34, which states that you shall love the stranger as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And we think a lot about that as we have speaking. Um, it seems as though those words could not be more appropriate today. We live in a world that, as we all know, feels more divided than ever, and in a country that is literally being split in two. And we've lost the tradition of coming together with people of different faiths, backgrounds, or political ideologies to break bread or matzah uh, and seek to better understand each other, um, which is exactly what makes today and this celebration of this space so important, especially in a city as large and diverse as Los Angeles. Uh, it's these exchanges that help us better understand ourselves and each other, our similarities, and, and as you said, our differences, which are real. I'm so grateful to have been here for that conversation. Um, and I'm grateful to each of you for all that you do, all the hard work you do. Uh, it's truly holy work. Um, I had the opportunity to visit with Dr. Namazika, I might have butchered your name too, <laughs> here at the Iman Cultural Center right after we celebrated Norwoos. Uh, I thought a lot the last couple of weeks since our meeting about the meaning of spring and how it represents new beginnings and how grateful I am for the opportunity to start afresh. Um, and those opportunities for growth and for love, for peace and for hope. Uh, and I hope that today uh, we can 
take that spirit forward with us into our communities and back to our homes and continue to make LA a city of belonging and a place where our shared humanity is elevated and our differences are embraced. And I love how you describe the word embrace and never thought about that. It's really good to find you to open up to you. That's something that's beautiful. Um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor. Um, thank you so much. moment for the imam at least this area and uh, about a few weeks ago or a few weeks there was an interfaith of thought in the city hall and I had the pleasure to know Councilman Mitya Rahman see I'm still in practice I practice <laughs> and I found out that I really, I was really impressed, as I was impressed with the KT, because we had a very good conversation at the bar, and had a very good conversation at City Hall with Kitty. Is that right? The first name, Kitya. 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 Oh yeah. Combine. I have to change my name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it was very, I was really impressed. Uh, with the presentation she had, and I invited her to join us to say a few words. Please come. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Those were beautiful words. Thank you. I was able to catch the end of your discussion as well, and it was really nice. You know, I, I'm Council Member Nithya Rahman. I represent the 4th District, which is no longer anywhere near here. The last time I was here for a um, security, interfaith security conversation, I think it was a year and a half ago. Right? Um, I used to represent neighborhoods that were closer to here, but now my district starts in Northern Silver Lake and goes all the way to Reseda through the Hollywood Hills. Um, but I'm very, very glad to be back here again. I'm glad to have caught the end of your conversation as well. Um, and this is actually my third iftar during this, uh, this month, which has been such a pleasure to be able to take part in, in um, these moments in the community uh, and to hear some of the conversations that people have been having. I wanted to just recognize my staff member, Ryan Nahari, who's here tonight, because Ryan really impressed upon me um, why this was important for us to take the leadership on in City Hall to host our interfaith iftar in the Tom Bradley room. Um, it was such a beautiful dinner um, and a beautiful ceremony and I was so glad to be there. He also helped us to ensure that we were able to light up City Hall and the 6th Street Bridge for Ramadan and it was lit up in green for seven days, seven nights. And it was beautiful, there's been videos of it floating around the internet, I don't know if you've seen it. But if you haven't, please look it up. It's, it was really, really gorgeous to see. And when I went to my second iftar, people came to me and said that they had taken their families and driven by City Hall and driven to the bridge so that they could see their city welcome them for the first time with green lights in a way that they hadn't before. And that was very, very meaningful to me to be a part of that. Um, and I want to thank Ryan for his help in making it possible for us to do that together. I think, you know, really, the, what is there to say after all this incredible dialogue and, and your words, Katie, um, except to say that this is my first time participating in these interfaith iftars. I've never been a part of these before. And it took me having to get elected to city council to participate in them. And I don't think that's how it should be. My conversations during these events, what I've heard, from the spiritual leaders who have spoken during them, what I've heard from the community that has come to attend them has nourished me and has made me feel better about my place here in Los Angeles, made me feel like my community is richer. And so what I just wanted to say today is just to make a commitment to all of you that next year I wanna invite more people into these spaces. And I hope that more Angelinos can come in and celebrate and break bread together and that we can open up 
these wonderful conversations, this incredible sense of community, this collective embrace, and lift more Angelinos up in that embrace than we have uh, during the events that I've been here, uh, been at this this uh, this year. But it's really been a pleasure, and I want to thank you all again for inviting me and for having me and for sharing this space once again with all of you. conversation about the hate crime and about a lot of things and people are well, free to ask any question they want. And uh, I met uh, Captain Craig uh, Heredia, is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, Captain Heredia and I was really impressed with his personality and I invite him to come here and say a few words about uh, what happened on Friday night and what he thinks about uh, uh, this, I don't want to put you in the spot for the governor, but what do you tell your experience about the meeting we had? Thank you, Captain. It's a pleasure to be back. I was just here a few days ago, and I have been learning so much about our world, the world that we live in since promoting to captain. Um, I promoted to captain in January of last year, and, and I've been um, able to have conversations about different cultures, different religions, different traditions, and it's making me a better person. So I just want to thank the, uh, the panel here tonight, and um, I'm really heartened by the conversation and the reality that we all have more in common than we do not have in common. And you know, all of our um, religions teach love, not hate. And that is something that um, we discussed on Friday evening where there is you know, far too much hate in this world. And we, as a Los Angeles Police Department, we investigate hate crimes and we work with our district attorney, we work with the FBI, we work with federal partners to prosecute those um, crimes. And when they happen, um, whether it's an assault with a deadly weapon or another type of crime, um, hate crime is an enhancement that um, allows for additional jail time. But we also investigate hate incidents, which are not a crime. We have the, uh, the First Amendment, that gives people the right to speak freely and to say mean and nasty and vile things without violating the law. When that happens, we want to know about it and we will document those as a hate incident because if that person who is doing that um, commits a crime later, then we have information that is tangible that we can use to support prosecution down the road. So I would encourage everybody um, to, to talk to your family members, talk to your children um, who may be bullied at school. Um, we want to work with all of our partners to make sure that we are addressing these issues. And rest assured, the LAPD, we investigate hate incidents with the same vigor that we do hate crimes. We go out and we canvas for video, we look for um, vehicles, license plates, so that we can follow up and tell people that what you're doing is wrong and we need you to stop. It might not work, but those are the things that we are doing to make sure that we care for the community and that we hold people accountable for, for the things that they are doing. And I also have the opportunity to, to sit on a lot of interviews for people who want to promote within our organization. And one of the things that, that stuck in my mind when somebody was talking about diversity, they talked about how we don't want to be a melting pot because a melting pot makes everything the same. We need to be more like a gumbo, right? More, more like a stew, right? Because the different ingredients, the different flavors are complementary and it makes us better. 
So that, that's just something that, that I kind of took away. And, and I appreciate, you know, um, I don't know your name, do you know yet? Umar. 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 My name is Craig. It's a pleasure to meet you. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate what you had said about the, the police department. And it just reminded me of something that um, I was told Chief Yates said years ago. He was approached by a reporter, and the reporter asked him, when are you going to have, um, sir, good morning, or good afternoon. Um, he, the reporter, the journalist asked him, when are you going to stop having corruption and scandals within your department? And without missing a beat, he said, as, as soon as I can hire outside the human race. I thought that was genius because we do have we, we do have good, bad, and indifferent in every profession. And when that happens within the police department, we need to be held accountable. There are officers who have made mistakes. There are officers who have done things that are criminal in nature, and they need to be held accountable. And and I agree with you know um, with George Floyd being murdered. That is not. There is no doubt that that actually occurred. And, and those things need to be addressed. And there's, we do not appreciate people who tarnish our badge and to make our jobs more difficult. By and large, most people who became police officers want to do a good job. They want to serve the community and they want to make life better. Whether it's addressing crime, whether it's addressing a quality of life issue, our job is to invest in the community, invest in people, and to make it better by addressing the, the, the negative issues and removing them. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, thank you all for sharing. I, I second the, uh, the open arms. That, that was a fantastic thing. And I'm always, I'm always trying to learn. And I might actually uh, steal that from you and use Feel it. Feel free, I stole it myself. <laughs> so it was fantastic. And, um, and thank you for allowing me to be here and say a couple words. Thank you. Doug, uh, can I say something real quick? Quick, 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 quick. quick. Uh, recently, uh, there was a hate incident at the Zombie Center of Southern California where uh, they wrote some hate speech on the front. And I'm going to commend the LAPD for uh, after giving the person, there was a homeless man, and the Zombie Center is, is asking for leniency on this homeless man to make sure he gets some other services. Because once we solve poverty, we begin to solve some of the violence that goes on in, this, in, our, in our society. So thank you for that. Congratulations on your promotion. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. We don't have time for a question. I'm sorry. No, it's not a question. It's a request. It is possible. Only no, we minute. can't. We, we don't have time because almost time for a talk. I'm sorry. Uh, give me a talk for Omar and Dr. Zaman is a little past. But we have water for you guys. You can start fast. <laughs> okay. I want to uh, tell a story myself. Uh, about 20 years ago, or 20, yeah, exactly 22, 20 years ago, I had a very good job. And all of a sudden, the administration of the place I was working kind of become unfriendly with me and caused some problem. So I took, uh, my boss asked me to have dinner for you. We went to have dinner. And he said, you know what's the problem? The problem is that you're exposing people to your religion. Okay, for anybody who hears this uh, comment, which I resigned after I heard that, that could be a reason to hate the people, to hate that person. That was the reason I created Lincoln Creek Festival in Unity, to fight with ignorance. We are not here to promote any religion or put down any other religion. <clears throat> religion. We are friends. I think that some of us spend more time with each other than our own uh, religious colleagues. But I really enjoyed this, and I hope everybody finds this uh, useful and educational. 
And at this moment, asking why the priority, uh, why the Benyak, to say a few words, to do a prayer, for the language we understand. May the spirit of our sense of finding each other be something that we embrace not only in these moments of conversation, but may they be a part of our daily lives. May the one who has brought us into being guard over us, protect us, and may we, in turn, guard and protect each other. May this spirit of peace descend in this spirit of repentance be a part of our presence to each other. May humility be a bigger factor in our public life. So in the spirit of Passover, the spirit of Ramadan, in the spirit of the holidays that we are observing. May we find that there is a connection one to another. We say this together. Amen. Amen. One of the uh, chants from the Easter service in the Catholic Church talks about forgiveness, which is certainly a theme of uh, the resurrection, and also renewal and commitment to one another. And so I'm going to share with you the words of that chant. This is the day of resurrection. Let us be illumined by the feast. Let us embrace one another. Let us call brothers and sisters, even those that hate us, and forgive all by the resurrection. And so let us all say, Amen. Brother Hakim. I'm going to make sure. it real quick. Yes. Um, thank you, God, for everybody that's in here. May the Korean branch of all health, security, and protection bless the food. I mean. Thank you. Okay, I want to introduce some people that are in, very important in our group. Uh, Ryan Harab. Is that right? Ali. Is a staff member of the uh, Council of uh, Arm, Arm, Roman, Roman. And Alan Zipper, Cancer Woman Katie, and also Mr. Maurice Montame, who served in the Iranian Congress, represented Jewish community in Iran. And uh, Mr. Mubaka, member of the Board of Directors of Iman. <laughs> you are too short, sure, stand up. Dr. Yavari, uh, board of director and his missus can be back here. Yes, yeah. These are the people who help us, we help them to run this center. And now we uh, listen to the call for the prayer. And after that, those who want to pray, they can go to the mosque. Those who want to have the star, they can go to the hall on the other side. 